Hello everyone, uh, my name is Brian Perkins and we're going to get an opportunity to uh, get our message started this morning. I uh, want to start off here with a word of prayer and for us to be able to get into our worship service. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much Lord at this time for all that you are doing uh, to be able to, number one, be able to protect your people, uh, but also always be present with us even during times of trouble. Father, I want to say a very specific prayer for many people uh, who are undergoing difficulties right now. I know our medical professionals are working overtime uh, to be able to take care of the needs of the sick. Uh, I pray so much for our children who may be displaced out of school and for those workers uh, who also may be displaced uh, because of this virus, the coronavirus that's going around. I do pray that you allow this message to be a message of encouragement uh, and uh, hope uh, for those of us who follow or are faithful in you. And I pray as well, God, that you will allow this to be a time when many hearts will turn uh, back to you. Thank you so much again, Lord, for all that you do. And I want to give a very special um, prayer and blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, everyone. Well, I'm super encouraged to be able to come here and to be able to deliver the Word of God in this format uh, through video. Um, the title of my message this morning is uh, A Call to Calm. And, you know, if you're on the bridge, you're actually able to get the notes. Uh, I've already downloaded the uploaded those on the bridge for all of us. I want you to please be opening your Bibles to the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 8. We're going to be reading a passage from there and talking about that uh, as we go along here. I know that right now we're living through a time uh, that's really, really difficult. It's a time of great fear. Many people around us are very afraid because of this worldwide pandemic caused by the coronavirus. Uh, and there's been a state of emergency call, not just here in Kentucky, but even a national emergency call. And this is not the very first time that God's people have had to live through a time of national panic. If we look at the scriptures, we see there are many times in Israel's history uh, where there is difficulty, maybe because of ailments, maybe because of disease, maybe because of war, uh, where, there, where there was lots of fear and there was uh, definitely a time of a panic that was going on. Here we're going to be looking at a passage, that, the setting of which is in the 8th century, uh, when King uh, Ahaz was over Judah and Isaiah was a prophet speaking for God and to God's people. He gave this message of hope. Uh, in the midst of national fear and the expectation of disaster that was looming on the sidelines. If you're here with me again, I want you to open your Bible to Isaiah 8, and we're going to just read verses 11 through 15. The Bible says, This is what the Lord says to me, with his strong hand upon me, warning me not to follow the way of this people. Do not call conspiracy everything this people calls a conspiracy. Do not fear what they fear, and do not dread it. The Lord Almighty is the one you are to regard as holy. He is the one you ought to fear. He is the one you are to dread. He will be a holy place. For both Israel and Judah, he will be a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. And the people of Jerusalem will be a, people of Jerusalem will be a trap and a snare. Many of them will stumble, they will fall and be broken and be snared and captured. You know, I want to read this passage up. Uh, because I believe it does have a great message for us today. This passage was written by the prophet Isaiah when God promised victory to Judah in the face of a huge threat that was coming their way. In verse 11, we read that the way of this people is the way of fear, or the, the way of people who don't follow God. He exclaims, man, Isaiah, I don't want you or your people to follow that same pattern. The, fear, the threat that was approaching them was a threat that was a real threat of armies, uh, uh, of enemies that were going to come against God and God's people. However, God did not want to let allow his people to have confidence in him. He said, I want you guys to be confident that I am still in control. Isaiah emphasized that the people of Judah should not be afraid of this alliance that was going on. And just to explain what was going on here, the, the, at this time, God's people were in a small little nation called Judah. Uh, the nation to the north uh, was the nation of Israel, and they were actually enemies. Uh, and the nation to the east uh, was a ram. And both these two nations had allied against them to destroy God's people. In addition to all that, there was this huge threat in the north. The Assyrians, they were going to come down and they were literally gobbling up nations all around them. And so here they were, this small nation, not very strong, getting ready to fight against an army that was bigger than them with another army coming soon to attack. I mean, it, it seemed at this point that there was no reason to have hope. Obviously, they couldn't stand up to any of these two groups. 
uh, and it seemed like certain destruction was on their doorstep. The Bible actually says in Isaiah 7 that the house of David was told, a ram has aligned itself with Ephraim. So the hearts of Ahaz and his people were shaken as the trees of the forest are shaken by the wind. I mean, this describes their fear like that. They were terrified. And again, it says, the Lord will bring on you and your people and all the households of your fathers, uh, the king of Assyria. And so as, they, as, they, as the people were feeling these threats from Isaiah, Isaiah 7 um, against Aram and Israel and, and Assyria, what were people to do? And there's a couple of passages, there's a couple of points here that I think God wants us to take away. I think point number one is this idea of conspiracy and fear. The Bible actually says in verse uh, 12, do not call conspiracy what these people call conspiracy. And do not fear what these people fear. The threats that they were undergoing were very real and very serious, uh, but they shouldn't be met with fear and dread, but with faith. Let's, just, let's talk about it for a moment. The conspiracy piece. So imagine this. You're the king of Judah, and you have this, these two nations coming against you. What should you do? Instead of king Ahaz turning to God, instead, he makes an alliance with Assyria. He makes an alliance with the biggest nation and says, hey, you guys can protect us. And at that point, you can imagine if you were a citizen of Judah, it would have been natural to say, okay, well, let's just back our leader. And uh, even though our leader is actually not very faithful here, uh, and if you stood against him, it would be considered a, a conspiracy. If you decided to join the other side, it would be considered a conspiracy. And so, in addition to the fear of what everyone was feeling, there was this idea of people were looking at each other and saying, you're against me, or who's on my side, or are you on this side? Uh, and it was really, really crazy, kind of what the people were going through. And I think this is really true. I mean, this idea of people being traitorous uh, or launching conspiracies is still alive today. I know that now we still need to guard against this, this, this threat. This, this is not the time for us to rail against political authorities or to try to talk about how one side is wrong or how other side is wrong or how each side is cons con uh, conspiring against the other uh, to see one side brought down. I know that one of the things that gets talked about on the news is, you know, is this, the, is this the president's fault? Is this the other side's fault? In actuality, these calamities come upon us and you can't point to any one person or group of people uh, because this is something that's natural. Uh, this is not something that's brought about by one person. The Bible says, don't call conspiracy what they call conspiracy. Mm. We need to focus on what God is trying to do. And again, it says, do not fear what these people fear. Now listen, fear here is real. Besides the loss of property and the loss of wealth, these people were very much afraid for their lives. Fear of death above all else, when there is no hope, or there is no expectation of eternal life, is very, very real. However, I think the Bible is speaking to us as well today. We should do whatever we can to protect human life, right? We should do whatever we can. Uh, if we need to meet in separate places or separate venues, if it can bring about protection for one life, we should be willing to do so. However, we who are God's people, we are all made in the image of God. We should remember that because Jesus is already Lord, we have prepared ourselves for the very worst of the very worst. You know, I get super encouraged by one fact that if the worst happens and if I should and if I should die, that I get to be with the Lord. Eternal Lord is a eternal a life is a promise given to all God's people. We shouldn't be afraid like people who have no hope. We should not run around like people who are in despair. But we should be a people who have a calmness and a and a, and a, and a, and a reassurance, knowing that God is in control, knowing that Jesus has already prepared us for the very worst of the very worst. But if that should not happen, if we do find ourselves in difficulty, be it financial, in difficulty because we don't have, we're not close to our friends or our loved ones in relationship, let us remember that we have God's church, we have God's people, we have God's presence with us. We should not fear what the world fears. They have no hope, but we do. Point number two, I want to talk about a word to the faithful. You know, this next passage, verses 13 to verse 14, he begins by saying, who is the Lord? Like, I know everybody's afraid and everybody's looking at all these conspiracies, but who is the Lord? And he says, the Lord is number one. The Lord is the one that you are to regard as holy. You know, he alone is set aside for us to hold in honor. He alone is the one for us to set aside uh, 
that we hold up and that we lift up and that we admire and that we talk about. I know right now as you look at uh, the media, it seems like everybody's talking about one thing, and that one thing is not God. That one thing is corona. That one thing is what's going to happen or look how many people are sick. But we have to hold up and honor God. When others are focused on fear, we have to remain focused on God. And I want to encourage you, you know, man, let that be what we talk about. As we Skype one another and message each other, as, as we get on the phone and talk to one another, let, let, let's allow God to be the one that we boast in. He says, number two, the Lord is the one whom you should fear and dread. I want to make sure I explain what, what the Bible means by this. It doesn't mean that we fear God like God is a disease or that God is going to be someone who hurts us. He alone is the one that we should both respect and the one that we should hold in high honor. The Bible talks about this over in, uh, in Exodus chapter 20, verse 20, uh, when the people of God were, were receiving uh, the Ten Commandments. And, you know, that if you remember that scene there at the bottom of Mount Sinai and and it says this huge cloud settles on the mountain and there's lightning and there's smoke and, and, the, and the prophets, are, 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 are the, 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 the priests are blowing these trumpets and that the mountain started to shake when God's voice came down and the people were terrified. And they said, God, they said, Moses, help us. And Moses says, listen, guys, don't be afraid. He says, God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. The idea about fearing God is not this fear of, oh my gosh, what's going to happen to me? But it's this idea of, God is the highest authority. God is the one whom I need to hold uh, um, accountable, my, my life accountable to. I don't need to be afraid of anything that can happen in this world because God is the one who's ultimately in control. He is the one that we should hold in awe. When you think about this time, and you think about all the different things that people are maybe, maybe afraid of or, or maybe terrified about, think about God himself. Think about the fact that God himself is looking down on us, that God himself Wants to be wants to be among us and wants us to hold him in honor and wants us to fear him. God does this so that we will keep ourselves from sin. You know, I think the other thing about honoring God is thinking about the sacrifices that were made through Jesus and about how Jesus says, "Man, I make these sacrifices so that you can be holy, so that you can be my people." Let us have let us use this time to really shine and let the best part of God come through us. That we honor him and we fear him by the way we live. And then the third thing he says here is that, that the Lord is a holy place for those who are righteous. I love this. What it means is that God alone is our sanctuary. Think about that. When you think about where do I go during difficult times? Where do I go when I'm distressed or when I'm afraid or when there's all these, uh, when I'm generally not in a position to be fired up? The Bible says that God should be our sanctuary. In Isaiah 4 verse 6 it says, He will be a shelter and a shade from the heat of the day and a refuge and hiding place from the storm and rain. I love that. It means that God protects us from natural dangers both simple and great. Times of disaster, they come upon us. Every every so often there's difficult, difficult times that come. Some of them can be just because of our lives in general. Some of them can be because of natural uh, calamities that fall upon us. But if we allow God to be our place of rest, if we allow God to be our point of trust, that we can actually remain calm during those storms. But you know, in addition to this, the Bible says in Romans 8, verse 28, which I've seen quoted many times over the last few days, that we know that in all things God works for those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. This passage doesn't mean that God is going to always give you candy when you're going through a difficult time. But what it does mean, it does mean that God has a purpose for good, even during difficult times. I know one of the things that I can testify in my own life is when I've gone through trials or maybe difficult times and at the time I feel, I don't feel very happy. I don't feel very comfortable. Maybe I feel angry. Maybe I feel stressed out. Maybe I feel afraid. Ultimately, God is working something great out of that situation. And that, that great thing could be salvation to someone else. That great thing could be a great benefit for other people. That great thing could be a benefit to me. But it always ends in benefit for those who follow God. And so I want to encourage us, even in this time, we might, we might not be able to see anything good uh, through what's going on, but God has a benefit already at stake. One of the things that's been interesting to me is over the last few days, as I've seen many of my fellow uh, ministers you know, online, uh, whether they're uh, preaching their messages through Vimeo or through YouTube uh, or through Facebook Live, 
uh, is that more and more people are going to hear the gospel because more and more people are kind of just locked at home, right? They're not out doing stuff that they shouldn't be doing. They're, they're at home. They're at home on, 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 the, on the phone. They're at home watching video. They're at home watching TV. And so here we are. We're preaching the word online. And who knows? Maybe more people will hear the gospel now than they would normally. Whatever God's purpose is behind this, we know that God is working for the good, and we can be confident in that. You know, my third point is this. God tells them, listen, there's conspiracy and there's fear. And we don't need to call conspiracy what they call conspiracy. We don't need to be afraid of what they fear. We need to remember the word to the faithful. But there is also a word here to the faithless. And listen to what he says here in verses 14b and 15. He says two things. Number one, the Lord to the faithless is a stone of stumbling and a rock of falling. What does that mean? Jeremiah 6, 21 says, therefore, this is what the Lord says. I will put obstacles before this people. Parents and children alike will stumble over them. Neighbors and friends will perish. Literally, this says that God was going to put obstacles before those who don't believe. People who choose to not follow God, they're going to find stumbling blocks. They're going to find opposition because of their lack of trust. Again, it says in the New Testament, over in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 8, a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall they stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. This passage is saying that the message that God has bring, brings to us is a message that was designed to make our way steady. It was a message that was designed to give us confidence uh, in the face of uncertainty, to give us calmness during a time where there's general panic. But the disobedient, because they don't follow that message, it actually will cause them to fall. And I think about this and I think, man, it's important to us that we heed God's message so that we don't find ourselves falling over the same message that God has delivered to us. A message that was meant to give us hope can be the same message that can deliver uh, people uh, to a bad place. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later on here. And again, it says that for those who don't believe, this could be a trap and a snare. And I was wondering, what, is it, what does it mean by that? This idea of a trap and a snare. Uh, a really cool passage in the same book, Isaiah 28, verse 13 says, So then the word of the Lord to them, again, talking about this people, these people who, who don't follow God, who, who don't put their confidence in him. To them the word of the God, the word of the Lord will become, do this or do that. A rule for this and a rule for that. A little here and a little there. So that as they go, they fall backward. They will be injured and snared and captured. I read that passage and I thought, wow. This verse is saying that the word of God becomes rules for people and they start to fall backwards. Instead of seeing, instead of seeing God as a, offering a relationship, offering comfort, offering love, offering peace, offering a refuge, instead, they see, they see it as a rule book. They see, man, following God is, is, is something that's odious to me. It's, it's something that's difficult. It's just this big challenge and I don't want to have anything to do with that. And so because they avoid God, they actually fall into a trap, into a snare. Uh, Haggai actually makes a, a reference to this over in Haggai 1, verse 5, 6. He says, for the people who don't follow God, it's like this. He says, in Haggai 1, 5 through 6, he said, give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much but harvested little. You eat but never have enough. You drink but never have your fill. You put on clothes but are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. In other words, every step you make, it just leads to more and more disaster. It doesn't get better for you. We have seen this. We have seen people, because of fear, they do one thing they think is going to call or give them relief, and that causes them a problem. And they do something else that's going, they think is going to give them relief, and that causes a problem. Until you get to the point where you just you end up hopeless. Like, there's no way I can run. There's no place I can put my hope. The Bible says that that is the ultimate fate for those who remain faithless during times of trial. You know, it's important to us that we don't follow those same footsteps of stumbling. Basically, what this means is that one act can cause different results. The same act of God causes a different response in different people. Isaiah and his people were faithful, even as those around him panicked. Just as we can reprove faithful now, even as those around us may panic. Just like an oven melts butter but hardens clay, 
So the same act of God can cause a different response in different people. The current crisis that we're facing will reveal what a person's faith is. If a person has faith in God, they know exactly where to run. During times of difficulty and trial, they know I need to run to God. I need to run to prayer. I need to run to confidence and trust that God provides. They know during times of trial that God's people are the ones that are going to bring me comfort. They know that God's word is going to bring me comfort. They know that prayer is going to bring me comfort. <clears throat> but for those who aren't people of faith, they think about, I got to sell off all my stock because I'm going to run out of money. They think about, I need to lock myself in my house because I'm afraid that something is going to come in and get me. They think about fear and anxiety and worry and stress. And it doesn't bring them anything but more and more, more and more <laughs> trouble and, and hardship. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know who's going to get sick or who may be taken from us. But the issue is not, what is God doing? The issue is, what is God revealing? What is God making known to us? I think God is showing himself to us. Here we are, people. We think we're powerful. We think we're kings of the universe, right? We can, we can control anything. We can do anything. And God can allow one little strand of RNA to cause the whole world to go crazy. Think about how powerful God is. Life and death is a certainty of us all. But praise God for those of us who have made Jesus Lord because our certainty is in him and our certainty is in heaven. My prayer is to be prepared and to prepare as many people as possible to be able to sneak with God, to prepare as many people as possible to be faithful and to know that God is with them. You know, I want to give a, a word of encouragement to all of us. You know, let us choose now to be wise. Let us choose now to act in accordance with all the medical professionals and all the authorities. Uh, like we said earlier, let's, let's not be foolish. Let's not, you know, act rashly and say, well, you know, God is in control. I don't need to worry about anything and, and not listen to wise counsel. But at the same time, let's remember the times and trials, they come and they go, but God is always in control. I guarantee you 10 years ago, there was a problem that everybody was stressed out about. I guarantee you that 10 years from now, there's going to be a problem that people are going to be stressed about. But God does not change. Let us be faithful to God, knowing that God will work, and he will work what is best for everyone concerned. Even if it seems difficult in the moment, God himself is working to bring about eternal, eternal glory for himself and to bring about great benefit for those who have faith in him. Thank you guys again so much for this time and for this message. And I pray that for those of you who have listened to it have been encouraged by what God has to say, and that we're going to bring this to, to a close with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Thank you so much again, Lord, for this time and for this message. Pray for all those who are listening to it, God, uh, that they can be encouraged to know that you have a word for us, uh, that the word is hope, that the word is encouragement, that the word is that you are still in control. Father, I pray that we will be faithful, that we will point and direct people towards God, that we will use this time, Father, to share our faith, that we will use this time, Father, to be active for you, that we will use this time, Lord, to trust in you like never before. Thank you so much again. We want to give you praise, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.